And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Mighty Narwhal Productions. Thankfully he managed to have his horn not break it off this time. And the, and the man who's bringing lights, camera, and action with the Mora cin Cinematic Universal Gaming System, the one and only Jeffrey Fowler. Don't call him a duck. <laughs> that's true. That's true. We are only narwhals here. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's mm -hmm. absolutely a really pleasure to be on here with you. Yep. I could have made a duck joke or a, or a baseball joke. I think I went with the better option. <laughs> I am I am a strong supporter of my you know Germanic and European roots, and I will shoot you if you claim to be a duck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, that fortunately that's not going to happen. Um, and um, I'd re and given the fact that I've that more than once at my at my day job I've had to get assaulted by geese, I'd rather not. <laughs> well, next time you know who to call, right? Yeah, <laughs> we'll take care of that problem for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, there's there's been geese and there's been um, turkey just wandering mm. around the place, not there in the go. not in the building obviously, but <laughs> um, of course, in that in that kind of situation with geese, I just shoot them on principle because geese are dicks. It's true. They are they are a vicious vicious avian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So I'd like okay. you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Um, okay, so this is a ways back. Holy crap. Um, I received from my aunt, um, when I was 13 years old, a copy of the uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player Handbook. The old... Uh, book with the red binding and the demon uh, temple demon on the front mm -hmm. the uh, the little rogue trying to pop the eye out the ruby eye out so that was actually how i got started um i devoured that book i thought it was the coolest thing i'd ever read um and i had no clue about the rest of it um and this is back in the i guess it would be <laughs> early 90s early early 90s um not to date myself too much but um that's what really got me started um I went from there to reading a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff, um, and then, <laughs> as we were talking about a little bit here before, it was um, Rifts. I went into Palladium Gaming after mm -hmm. starting on Dungeons and Dragons. Um, all through high school, we basically played. My friends and I did a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of Palladium, whether it was Rifts or GURPS or uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was another uh, big hit, and, and that's I kind of where it got started for me. Um. Since you since you mentioned the Palladium system, did you ever do Heroes Unlimited? Oh my God, yes! Heroes Unlimited was one of our favorites. Right. Um, Heroes and Vill Heroes and Villains Unlimited both were mainstays of my gaming group for a really long time, and our uh, because they meshed so well with Rifts, we did a lot of combos. Mm -hmm. So we would have we would have superheroes in the world of Rifts and um, bad guys in the world of superheroes. In, fa in fact, since since you had spent that since you had spent so much time with um, with with palladium, would you mind would you mind if I do a bit of a lightning round when it comes to um, some of the stuff in my archives with with um, palladium megaversal just to see if you had di if you had dipped into this kind of thing? Go for it, hit me, boss. All right, um, beyond the supernatural. Absolutely. All right, um, dead rain. No, dead rain is now one that I've played. All right. Um. We already mentioned Heroes Unlimited. Um, yeah. Nightbane. Yes, Nightbane is a big, big fan. I I will admit that the that um and if that the thing the the thing that drew me, of course, with Nightbane was seeing was seeing that weird ass cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually reached out from um we reached out to the owners of um uh, Nightwatch um not Nightwatch. I'm sorry. Um. Why am I blanking on the name? I'm totally blanking on the name right now. Um, the thing that inspired Nightbane, the 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 movie that inspired it, which is I can't believe I'm blanking on. We reached out to them actually to do a license for a genre. Um, we hadn't we didn't hear back from them sadly, but yeah, they're one of the 
they were one of the big inspirations for one of our co-creators. Huge fan. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Okay, here's here's one of the bigger ones: ninjas mm -hmm. and super spies. Love ninjas and super spies. <laughs> Oh, all right. Um, and what, one of the other big ones, um, Palladium Fantasy. So I did like I can't say I know that one well. I've thumbed through it, but I never got to play it. Mm -hmm. I owned a couple. I owned some of the stuff for it, um, but I never actually got to play it with my gaming group. All right. Um, next on my list is Rifts, which we already talked about. Um, Amen. Robotech. Yes. Huge fan of Robotech. Mm -hmm. I like I I like it although I although I have to make sure to call it Mac Ross so that my Mac fa so that my Mac buddies don't get pissed at me and also um not the, anymore brother yeah not one <laughs> not not anymore and two um Harmony Gold fuck you <laughs> I am legally obligated every every time Mac Ross is brought up to say fuck Harmony Gold <laughs> true but uh, they did did you hear they came to the deal there will be new Mac Ross stuff and new Robotech anime coming out Harmony Gold has reached deal. Yeah, I heard that they. F I heard that they finally stopped bitching. Now, if now if only if only they could get off of um, off of Hairbrain and Piranha's ass about 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 the un about the unseen mechs. True, that's that's fair. But, but I'm very excited to see more stuff come out of there. Yeah, so there's been there's been a bunch there's been a bunch of stuff that's only been available through um fan subs for the mm -hmm. longest time. Um, For sure, it is very cool to see I, Robotech and Mad Cross getting a new polish. I do, I do wonder if this is them. Ed, this is them admitting defeat <laughs> because for the longest time they were, um, they were trying to get a live action Robotech movie off of the ground, and it was going through development hell for over a decade. It's very possible. Like it's really hard when it comes to lic licensing and rights IPs and stuff. It is tough because TV and movies, especially in the age of Netflix what, and streaming, right? Like that is. That is where you hope you can take your beloved IP. You want to give it life through that again if you can. And uh, so many of those projects get started and then never develop or get developed and then never see the light of day. It's it's heartbreaking in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, Splicers. Splicers, yes. All right. Um, systems failure. No, I don't know that one. Yeah, that was a um, that was a that was a that was a weird one. Um, mm -hmm. Sounds like it. I, I can't, I can't, I can't describe it as the pre as the precursor to the laundry files. Okay, Splicers was a huge fan because of um, juicers and stuff like that from Riffs. It was a segue. Um, <laughs> like that was one of the ones that I remember picking up after seeing some of that stuff. But I had not heard of uh, of. What was it? System. Yeah, systems something. failure. Systems failure. That was it. Yeah. Um. After the bomb. Yes. Absolutely. Let's see. Let me see if I miss. Um. Okay. No, I thought I had. I th there was one I thought I was looking at, but no, that that that's a module, so that's not going to count. Um. The Valley of the Pharaohs. Uh yes, I think I actually think I have that one on my shelf. <laughs> All right, so there's there's definitely been a there's definitely been a fair amount of experience. I think you're the first I've had that's had that amount of experience when it comes to Palladium <laughs> since um, since Jeremy Jack. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's it was I loved a lot of Palladium books. Um, when I first got into it, I got really voracious. So yeah. I have a lot of their old stuff. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, when now um obvious now obviously obviously after after stuff like that you've um ju you've jumped around between b between different um games over the years and wor and working on a ha and working on other people's um s other people's systems. Yeah. So that brings me to the um. To the Mora Cinematic Universal Gaming System, which I'm just going to call the Mora System because I am not made do. by the syllable. <laughs> Absolutely, please do. And and um more and I can't make I can't come up with a good enough acronym to use to use without 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 um murdering my mouth. 
Yeah, that was purposeful. Um, we wanted to make sure that Mora was the easiest part of it to say, and there was not an easy acronym for it. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> when we went to Mora Universal Gaming System, yeah, or like, that was why we originally had it as that, and then we changed it to more a cinematic gaming system mm -hmm. because we didn't want our game to be known as Mugs. <laughs> well, it's bad. It's bad enough that you, it's bad enough that there's a game exists called Jags, just another exactly. gaming system. Yep, I, I we were mean, very, very careful. I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to. I don't mean to bully. I don't mean to bully Jags. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention things like Foo, Freeform Universal, and um, mm -hmm. um. Um, Torg, which West End's the other role-playing game. Oh, <laughs> I had not heard Torg before. That was a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, that that was Torg. It, for a lot of for a lot of people, when they think of West End, they're thinking of the D6 system, either through Ghostbusters mm -hmm. or through um, Star Wars. But Masterbook was their other was their other um, project that didn't quite catch on. Although it had some interesting ideas, mm -hmm. um, now some of the names that you that you mentioned that you've that you've worked on that that provided yeah. a bit of a element for uh, Mora were um, old and new World of Darkness. Um, yep. I know I know that I'm supposed to I know that I'm supposed to call it Classic and Chronicles, but I but when the whole thing started, it was it, uh, the term that was used was old and new World of Darkness for me, and um, and I see no reason why. Why I should um, fit? Why I should fix that? Um, um, since I'm not working with them anymore, working for them anymore, I can agree with you. <laughs> but yeah, um, um, Paizo and Sh and Shadowrun. So, uh, so I haven't worked personally for Paizo. Um, that was one of our creator, one of our mighty narwhals. Um, uh, has also has worked for them. One of our one of my uh, partners, and I've worked on. Old World, Old of Darkness, New World of Darkness. Um, I've worked with Catalyst on Shadowrun, mm -hmm. and then I have done some stuff for uh, Dystopia Rising, and for Onyx Path. All right, do that. So, um, now the now when it comes to when it comes to the creation of Mora, what what was the spark that that gave that gave you the notion of we know we need to make a universal system? So. It, the Mora is basically the brainchild of our creative director, Jason Andrew. Um, he had an idea, like, he's also been a very prolific game writer. Um, mm -hmm. He's worked for Catalyst, for for uh, By Night Studios, and White Wolf, that, those, those aggregates, and then Paizo and whatnot. And there was a lot of feeling of, we've spent so many time and so much effort building other people's houses, that it'd be really kind of cool to build our own. Um... And we were sitting, and this is going to appeal to your heart, uh, we were sitting in a bar in Canada. And <laughs> um, we had gone up to a convention, and we started spitballing ideas. We went and started talking about like what we would want, what would be cool, like, what does everybody know? Like, in this day and age especially, there's very few people who do not know TV and movies. Like, we could use those terms and build something off it, like like main characters, like... What have we seen in like problems in our gaming groups? Like, what can we? How can we address those? And that's really what birthed Mora was that you know conversation over drinks, and uh, we had a couple of notebooks that we were passing back and forth, scribbling notes on each other's. And finally, like at the end of the evening, we're both looking at each other and uh, going, "This could work. Like, we could actually do this. Like, this is this is here." And that's what started it. And we decided that we were going to form a company mm -hmm. going to call Mighty Narwhal Productions, um, which was built after a joke that was from when we were both working for By Night Studios mm -hmm. and uh, that we thought was really funny. So we were going to roll with it. And then that was pretty much where Mora was born. We spent the next couple of years tweaking it, playing with it. We did some betas and some play tests. And then we finally looked at it and we're like, all right, we... Um, this is as polished as we can get it without talking to other people, without getting this involved. So let's do it, and then we launched a Kickstarter. Um, now you you mentioned the name started out as a joke. Is this is this one of those really inside kind of jokes, or is it a case of you attack the gazebo? <laughs> no, um, it's it's sort of inside, but I'll, I'll explain it. It's pretty easy to explain. Um, there was a running joke when we were making we were working on um, Werewolf the Apocalypse mm -hmm. at the time, and 
uh, I was a subject matter expert for that, for that, and I was also one of the writers. So when we were doing it, there was always a lot of questions being thrown at me, like, "Hey, can we keep this? What do we? What does this mean? And how does this work? And whatnot?" And I had made a joke at one point in time about totems and how the different totems were a- aspected to different um, incarnate and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I made the joke that Narwhal should be a, a child of Gaia totem because it's the unicorn of the sea, and. That's what started it, and then narwhal jokes began to kind of just be my thing. Like people would make narwhal jokes to me, and then they started sending me narwhal plushies and pictures. Um, I have a, I have on my office a picture. Uh, one of our fans, their twin, her twin daughters wrote or drew for me and colored in, um, and sent to me stuff like that. And so it became just like this running joke about I was the narwhal guy or or mighty narwhal or whatnot. And that's when we decided to use it. We're like, well, let's let's own it, <laughs> and that's what we're gonna call our company. Yeah. Now, w- now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to Mora, you're you, as the long-winded name des- describes, and the um very in- very interesting um, box art implies, you're going for okay. cinematic. Yeah. Which is a word was is a word that I that I saw get bandied about quite a bit, especially in the two thousands. So something <laughs> I'm curious about is how you how you guys are going about the cinematicness. Because I will admit, if somebody was going to play word association with cinematic role play, the first thing that's going to come to my mind is um, feng shui. <laughs> um, I can see that. So the way we but the way we go about cinematic is this: like when you're making characters, right? Think about just your standard, like, normal, even just uses... We'll use Dungeons & Dragons as an example, right? Mm -hmm. you got a Dungeon Master, and you've got, you know, four or five people sitting around the table. And you guys are all telling a story together. All right, cool. But the the moments that you really remember in those gaming sessions are which time each people had a chance to be really cool. Mm -hmm. And when you all came together to be really cool. And what we equate that to is main characters in movies, right? Like, you... The moments you remember are when they have these moments of being really either dramatic, like these horrible emotional moments, these dramatic action sequences, like these moments when people are being really cool, being really impressive. Mm. And that's the moments we want to highlight in our game. And that's why we call it cinematic, because it's all built around these, the idea anyway, that instead of you role-playing as a character, what you're role-playing as is a writer for that character. You're putting a show together or putting a movie together. You are the writer who controls the the fate and the destiny of that character along with the other writers in your room. Mm. And you guys have to tell a story together, giving everybody a shot to, to, to be cool because, you know, if you, if you frame it in that cinematic idea, right? Mm-hmm. You guys have paid these actors a whole bunch of money to star. You want to make sure they're cool so that you guys get renewed. <laughs> so, like, that's, that's the kind of, like, the mental process we want people to be thinking about is... What are these cool moments? What makes this guy awesome? Why do people keep tuning in to watch this guy or this girl, um, or this or this person, who, whomever um, that you're writing for? What makes them awesome, and how can you best portray that in the story? Mm-hmm. And that's where cinematic really kind of comes in. Now, when it comes to like now, when it comes to the one of the key. When it comes to the uni- when it comes to the nature of it being a universal game, um, mm-hmm. one of the one of the big one of the big questions that I always end up having with with universal games is how is how they handle the massive choice because well, choice paralysis is a, is a thing in a lot of um are, in a lot of games and even more Absolutely. so when it comes to universal games. Um, mm-hmm. So how do when it comes to character creation, how do you what how do you mitigate um, choice paralysis? So a couple of a couple of ways. Um, one of the biggest ways we do it is um, our character is based on budget, and when you're creating the creating the game itself and deciding what kind of game you want to play, the budget is what tells you how your character creation process is going to go. Like, do you want a low powered game? You're going to have a lower budget, like syndication or you know pilot script. Um, that gives you kind of like a bare bones get started. Maybe you want to play a really high powered game. Okay, cool. Then you're going to play like, you know, throw your budget to be like blockbuster movie or, you know, syndicated TV or uh, network TV show. Mm-hmm. That gives you 
an opening on how many qualities, how many, like the amount of character development and a lot of starting anyway, what you're going to have and what your maximum is. So like the way our system works is it's story based. So if you're, while you can spend XP and grow your characters in one, certain ways, there's still limits. And that unless you want the budget to get bigger, as a as a as a storyteller, as a director, or whatnot, it doesn't. It stays there. So there's a cap. So you don't have to like at certain points it becomes more about the story because you can't be buying newer, wackier qualities, things like that. You're just developing the character itself, allowing them to get stronger in their aspects without blowing out of the water the amount of choices that people have to make as they like do you know character progression and things like that through you know special powers or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So it it comes very much with the idea that you guys as a group decide what kind of story you want to tell, and then we frame out how you can tell that story. Um, and if it wanted to grow, you can. If you don't, it doesn't have to. All right. Now, when it now uh, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, co- when it comes to the core die mechanic. Um, mm-hmm. I, are you are you guys going with a sum based approach? Are you going with a pool based? What what sort of um, what sort of polys am I throwing? You throw in dice sixes, a couple of d six, and a pool. Um, so it's basically your attribute, whatever attribute is most effective in that situation. Your skill plus any kind of weird wild card bonus you want to get, give, etc. And then um, two dice six. Mm-hmm. Now, since it's two since it's two dice six. It, are there are there any um are there any special results that can happen if somebody's rolling box cars or rolling snake eyes? Sure is. Um, you know, box cars. You get if you're rolling double sixes, you get to get, roll again and add a, get, add both of those dice to another one, so you can end up rolling four dice six. And if you keep rolling box cars, then you can get some wacky wacky numbers. Um, and if you roll snake eyes, then you're automatically failing at whatever you do, and it's gonna come out bad because you're gonna also pick up a consequence of some sort. Now, and I can explain a little bit more consequences later. Yeah. Um. Actually, and what, now, um, when it comes to when it come when it comes to um special when it comes to specializations within um a, within mm-hmm. attributes, um, yeah, is that is that a is 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 that a, what's the what would be the difference between at between um. Um, specialization in attributes versus specialization in um, skills. Um, there's not a lot of difference. They're used for very much the same things, but they apply bonuses differently. So, like, mm-hmm. um, for example, like if you have a body specialization, you might have a body specialization of agile, right? So you're quick. You're mm-hmm. you're you're an agile individual. Your skill specializations are skills are based more on what you can do, not who you are. So, like, that's where you're like you're fighting. You're you know, crime, your transportation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so those those specializations are more into what you can do versus who you are. So, and I'm sorry. Can I can I pause one second? Can I be right back? Yep. Now, when I look at the when I look at the um, character sheet, there's a, there's a few <laughs> um, there's a few th- there's a few things that um, that I'm cur- that I'm curious about. One, sure. Um. A lot of universal style games go for a um, point a point based a point based approach at creation and a experience as currency approach when it comes to advancement. Are mm-hmm. you following suit in that tradition? And if not, how are you deviating from it? Yeah, we are. We we do follow that kind of sim- same kind of progression where. Mm-hmm. Um, your initial budget determines starting character points. Um, what, how many points, and how much your distribution is into different uh, attributes, ca- skills, qualities, etc. And then XP is how you build. So that's where you can buy new qualities, up your attribute numbers, up your skill numbers, buy new specializations, things like that. Now, within that, is is it a case where it where it's listed safe? So so if your budget is if your budget is at this tier. This is how many points you get for everything, or is it listed as this is how many attribute points you get, this is how many skill points you get, this is how many quality points you get? Attribute, quality, skills. Yep, we we lin- delineate in each budget level what the um, what the caps are for each category, basically, mm-hmm. um, so that you can't get 
uh, I mean, for the most part, it's a little bit to prevent like the kind of min maxing of like I'm. You, we give you a certain amount of points, and you don't buy any qualities. You just max out all your attributes. You're like, skills are for weaklings. I'll get them as we go. Um, so you do have to flesh out and become an actual full character. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's how we go. Um, with that in mind, I'd like you to give me a few examples on wh on what the what the point spread would look like for various tiers of budget. Uh, sure, yeah, I can do that for you. I'm going to have to pull it up because I also have been drinking and that is not something I want to quote from memory. <laughs> so, but I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see here. See, I can even promise you about the bookmarks we were talking about earlier. Things are getting better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so like, for example, um, I'll give you where we kind of hear, like, um, just looking at what our hair is like, our punching Nazis is one of the genres we have in our book. And, uh, it's kind of built with a larger budget it has the blockbuster level budget. Um, and the character points is starting attributes. You have 12 points to spend there starting skills, 15 and quality points, 13. So you have a generous amount of, of room to play with when it comes to, like a uh, um, a blockbuster level um, uh, budget, and let me grab the rest of them here. Mm -hmm. I have to remember what the hell else we put. There we go. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And I um I'm sad to say that we are also still working on the uh oh no, you're gonna love this. <laughs> I can already have the bookmarks. Um so okay. Um the budgets that we have are independent movie slash web series. Um and that's the most basic. That's the lowest level budget that you can have. It's kind of your introductory. Um you get eight points to spend in attributes, ten points to spend in skills, and eight points to spend on quality up to a maximum of eight. So we do have some qualities that are actually more expensive than this budget ceiling. Mm -hmm. So you can't, they literally cannot be bought in this, in this budget. You'd have to have a higher one to do. Yep. Um, and we tested those specifically to make sure that, and then it goes up to movie of the week, which is, and, or slash syndication. Mm -hmm. And that's still eight attributes. It's 12 points in skills and 10 points on qualities. Uh, when, then you have, well, when you mention movie of the week, that that brings me to the question: Is that it, would movie of the week be on the tier of the kind of thing that would be on um, would would be featured by by a mystery science theater or even Joe Bob Briggs? For sure, <laughs> you could absolutely build like I have. I'm not even kidding. I've seen somebody build a genre that is very much like um, mystery science theater, mm -hmm. where they're playing writing characters who are playing like the idea behind the story is that they are people that are reviewing other things, trying to get, uh, trying, trying to actually get signed onto a network show and things like that, where mm -hmm. people have played the kind of the meta of like, I'm going to play this role-playing game about playing these writers and directors trying to get their show sold to cable TV. Yeah. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely possible with the system. Yeah. Now, when it comes, now when it comes to, when it comes to the when it comes to the four attributes, which seeing mm -hmm. body, mind, heart, and soul like that, I ended up getting a bit of tristat flashbacks for a second. <laughs> uh, yeah. But when it but um, now I can now I see that I see that each of them has a form of script armor resistance. Given yeah, the, plot uh, armor. <laughs> yeah, basic basically. Um. Mm -hmm. Given that, given that, when it comes to when it comes to um, conflict and and combat, is it is it a case where uh, where um a lot or a lot of times the attacks are go are trying to be go are going to be going straight to the attributes? Right. So the way our system works is you don't have hit points. Um, the attributes you get you develop consequences for failing at things or for being hurt by things, mm -hmm. and consequences dr apply directly to your attributes. Um. They apply in, in a number of ways, like specializations in your attributes, for example, are ways to negate consequences. 
you can spend your specialization, which means you can't use its effect anymore in order to negate a consequence that might hit that attribute. Mm -hmm. But if you ever acquire more consequences in the attribute than you have points, you get knocked out. And you're knocked out of the, out of the scene and possibly the story itself, um, which means you have to make decisions on how to do it. So like, if you have a body of three and you take three consequences to body, you're knocked out. But if you have that agile specialization we were talking about, you can blow the specialization in order to prevent one level of those consequences, and then you're just walking around with two consequences, and you still have a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's the same way with all the attributes. Now, when it comes when it comes to now, um, I know you mentioned that that um the but that the budget is going is going to is going to determine um how much how many the um point budget that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. for character creation but within that i'm curious what factor a character's choice of archetype plays i mean archetype does a lot of things in our system um it gives you well, let's see the best way to describe archetype what archetype does more than anything is gives character direction mm -hmm. um it kind of helps frame what you're you're absolutely going for like what the what your character's attitudes are um it kind of lets you fill in what I guess. Let's see, I'm bit, like you want to be able to kind of define when you're all sitting down to write your characters what each person is kind of about, what characters about. So you can either double up or you can avoid doubling up things like that. <clears throat> so you these archetypes help kind of frame out what kind of character you're gonna build. Like I'm gonna use punching Nazis again because it's one of the genres that I, I really enjoy and. Um, it's, it's very kind of used a lot in our examples. Um, there's one called a Dragon Ace, which is an archetype. And that Dragon Ace is literally, um, think about, you know, a pilot that instead of flying a, a, one of the newer planes in the World War, flew a dragon. Like, these were, these were their, their aerial combat. And so by choosing that archetype you're kind of announcing what this character is going to be about you know he's going to be a dogfighter you know he's going to be a guy that flies either he's, he's a bomber or a dogfighting pilot like that's the kind of things he's going to do so as if you and i are playing together and you're like okay I'm, i want to play dragon ace i can look at that and go like okay do we want to do a story about a squadron okay cool maybe we'll all play dragon aces and we're going to be doing a you know like the story we want to focus on is this this squadron during the war or you know, do we want to be a behind, you know, like kind of a infiltration group? Okay, well, if we're going to play infiltrators for the story, that that one isn't going to work real great because you can't bring your dragon. Maybe you want to look at something like Monster Hunter or Super Soldier, um, things like that. So it, it's a way to frame what you're doing and why, um, and let everybody else know kind of where you're going with it and what character you really want to play in the story. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind. Um, mm -hmm. I did. I did want. I did want to ask about um, co about qualities and co and um, consequences. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> having gone around the block when it comes to universal games, I can kind of infer what they're what they're supposed to be. What mm -hmm. I'm curious about is what steps you've taken to make sure that 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 those that that particular um, paradigm does not get min maxed. Um, so a couple of things. Um, budget ceilings are a part of it <clears throat> in that, like like I was talking about earlier, if you're playing at a lower budget, depending upon what budget you're playing at, you have a ceiling on which you can't have a quality more powerful than that number. Mm -hmm. um, and so we leveled the qualities very specifically in their point cost to make sure we didn't put any quality that was so overpowered that it would destroy the balance in a lower budget game. So that's step one. Step two is really what everybody has to do, which is exhaustive playtesting. Um, we spent a lot, a lot of time. Um, we ran two real big events. One we did over Discord, and one we actually did live as a live action um, event um, before the pandemic. And um, we had everybody play them out, and we, we saw what ones were, you know, we found out like people were using ways that were busted that we had never thought about. And then you go back and edit. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's perfect because no system is like. And if somebody comes, if I ever meet a creator that says they have created the perfect system, I'll know that a they're either lying to me about creating a system, or b they're drunk as hell uh, <laughs> because there's no way. Why but not yeah, both? like I mean, there's entirely possible that's both, and I've I've met those people. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much what it is. Is like just looking at quality wise anyway. What 
we can get as many as eyes on it as possible to play with it, mm. jerk it around, mess with it, try to get like I like I've been uh, gaming for a long time, and so I have a lot of friends who are min maxers, um, a lot of friends that are role play junkies, a lot of, like all, pretty much anybody in the spectrum, and they're the people that I reached out to and said like, okay, I got this baby, please you know try to break the system. Tell me, tell me what I'm missing. Tell me what you would do to make this broke as hell, or what did I screw up? And all of us did that, and we just kind of twisted it and turned it and poked it around as much as we possibly could to see if there was something we could miss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to specializations within skills, I've mm -hmm. seen I've seen specializations show up in some, in some form in other um, skill based um, setups. Is it Absolutely. a case where it just gives? Is it a case where having a specialization gives you a static bonus, or do, or does it infer other benefits? It does infer other benefits. It gives you a static bonus, um, like you would think of, um, in roles and stuff that are specific to that particular action. But like I mentioned before, it also serves as a way to avoid consequences. Um, mm -hmm. So your specialization, you can call on the power of your specializations in order to protect you from the consequences of either failing that action or failing a different action or to protect somebody else. Because the way our system works is, because it's very collaborative, if you and I are playing, for example, and you get shot, and you have three body, and you already have two body consequences, I can blow a specialization to leap in front of you. And take that, con you know, negate that consequence for you. Like, I jump and push you out of the way, or I knock the dude's arm as he's shooting, things like that. Um, and so specializations are very much both offensive and defensive in nature. And that specializations give you bonuses to rolls, as well as prevent protect you from consequences. Mm -hmm. Now, with that does br that does bring me to the other question: Are um, mm -hmm. are specializations ranked, or is it a case of you either have it or you don't? Have it or you don't. All right. Yep. Very easy. We didn't want to get too complicated in it, um, but yeah, like it's it's so uh. We're, so we're not dealing with the shadow run sk skill and sub skill <laughs> list. <laughs> Correct, sir. Um, as as a guy who has written those, I did not want to do it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which, speaking of that, how many? If you were to hazard a guess at it, how mm -hmm. many? Um, how many? Sk how many skills would you say you have in total? Um, I could tell you. Three, four, six, fifteen. We have fifteen skills. 15. 15 skills that are our base skills, and then each genre can actually the way you, when you build out your genre, if there are special skills that specifically like best like are needed for that one, um, for like oh, what's that one? Um, some genres have them because like um, if you're playing in a fantasy one, you need a magic skill, right? Mm -hmm. If you're playing in a generic world where there are transforming robots that people can pilot you might need a mecha skill. <laughs> um, things like that. So genres, we have our base skills, which is the 15 core. And then we have um, what we call genre skills. And those are skills that are based on the the, the setting you want to play in. And those are, those are at the director and the writers kind of um, at their leisure for what they want to add into it or what they think is necessary. Mm -hmm. Now... Give, given the given the um given the setup um mm -hmm. i am i am curious what's the difference between motive between motivation quirk and background are they ma are they mainly um mainly there for for role playing or do, or do they have some um mechanical effects um they're mostly there for role play. Um, a lot of what they do is is to continue to round out that character and and see what what you're mm -hmm. you're motivated for, what kind of like things that are to build that that background. Um, so they're not they're not really mechanically uh, at least as, not that I remember <laughs> unless we've changed it, but I don't remember of them being a uh, there's a mechanical bonus to them. They're mostly for that helping that character creation. Mm -hmm. And. When it comes to when it comes to them, what would you what would you say is the narrative difference between um, between a between a quirk, a motivation, and a um, background? Um, okay, so a quirk is what makes you interesting in a lot of ways. Um, basically, like we were talking about her before, like what if I'm playing that squadron of dragon aces, right? I got four friends. 
they're all playing dragon aces. Quirks can help make those characters a little bit different. Um, one of my favorite ones, uh, Quirk is cocky. Um, it's you're you know more than just a little arrogant. You take chances other people shy away from. Cocky is a great way to say like, okay, that's the way I'm playing this character is literally fly by the seat of his pants. Believes he can do anything. That's that's how I'm going to run this this one, which is very different from a dragon ace who is, for example, a has a, a heart of gold. Right, mm-hmm. they're the person that's out to defend others. The reason they they joined into this was to protect other people. Right, um, and then you know add in the other ones like the you know you're you're spoiled or you're tough or whatever whatever it happens to be. Quirks are a great way to define differences in characters and what makes them a little bit special Mm -hmm. backgrounds are where you came from like that's what we look for is like how did you grow up where did you get here like you know um are you a city boy or were you country born you know like that kind of stuff like did you did you enlist because you have you got into trouble with the law like do you have a criminal past that kind of stuff so that's what backgrounds do is kind of establish where you come from oh all right and when it com- and when it comes to quirk oh quirk sorry quirk was the uh, who you are all right um which one did i miss quirk background and motivation motivation that was it sorry you're right <laughs> um so motivation is i guess the See. motivation is kind of what we call this whole like big category of where you're called to adventure where your quirks your background tropes all that all stuff to get, and then what side you're on mm-hmm. um but like that's kind of the the broad spectrum of this little subcategory um but one of the things in there is we do have a lot of uh the what side you're on is one of my favorites um because it makes you pick a side in a conflict right some sort of like um you know, are you are you guys playing heroes or are you playing villains? Are you the good guys or are you the bad guys? Like, you are you criminals? Like, are, because you're rebels? Or are you, you know, on the side of law and justice? It makes you choose and gives you kind of this guideline for while you're playing of decisions and how they make them. And if they have to break them, what that, how big of a deal that is. Like, you know, when we watch a movie and you see the guy who's absolutely you know heart of gold healer like doctor who has something tragic have in their life and then they turn to a life of crime you, the punisher the punisher is a great example of this right mm-hmm. you go from being a, a cop who is enforcing the law to having this bad thing happen and now they are a vigilante out for justice they still think they're doing good in some cases even if they're doing it the wrong way so like that's kind of where the what side you're on comes into play, and it gives you that like really inspiration for how characters develop. Now, when it comes to now, when it comes to the um, when it com- when it comes to consequences, one of the one of the mm-hmm. things that I saw is that um, the is that it's listed with a attached um attribute. How yeah. does how does that play out? So, um, in a number of ways. So, like one of the the cool things about consequences is they do affect a specific attribute which lets you um you know that's where it comes down to what our like our our version of hit points and things like that come from but the other thing about consequences is they have a narrative effect so like not only are they um not only are they like a version of hit points but they're also giving you what (laughs) Uh, trying to trying to figure out the best way to put basically how a great way to role play the continue the continuation of like what happens when these things when these bad things happen to you like a body consequence could be a broken leg right like you're you know you're trying to leap from a uh, from uh, building to building you miss you fall you break your leg okay now until that consequence goes away you maintain that broken leg so you have to deal with the fact that you're slower you you know you have this pain and whatnot all the different consequences for the different categories have those types of effects. So you have a lot of, um, like, even if they're mind or soul consequences, they have a very strong impact on how, not only what's happening to your character sheet, but also how you're role-playing. And that's really what we went, we looked for the most in them, was how do we give people these cool, like, mechanical effects, 
while at the same time helping them establish even a cooler way to roleplay and a way different ways to roleplay. Mm-hmm. Now, within the, within that, um, now the the other thing that the other thing that I I was cur- I was curious about is mm-hmm. the um, is the genre sheet. Um, mm-hmm. Now within now within that, um, I've seen I've seen in ca- in cases of games like say Genesis where the genre sheet or the campaign sheet will have a list of allowed and not allowed um, options when it comes to character creation. When it comes to yep. the jo- when it comes to the genre of certain films, do you have do you have guidance as far as what might be a good or bad idea to use in that in that or are you trying to paint with as much of a broad brush as possible? Um, a little bit of both. We do give you we give you tools to do it. You can define obviously. It's kind of very much what works for you. If it doesn't work for you, keep throw it out, kind of a deal. But like um, one of the things we have in there is uh, the rating system. So, like I said, we we use a lot of movie and TV lingo to do this, right? But mm-hmm. when you're defining the genre, you give it a rating. Um, if it's rated G, it's general audiences. It's appropriate for all viewers. Like that's the kind of stuff you're going for. Is it a rated R movie? Okay, this is like you know this is 300 or Mad Max Fury Road. Like that's the the gritty, dark. There will be blood and gore kind of feel to it, and that helps kind of when you're creating the genre, mm-hmm. determine what level of what level of buy-in people are, should have in when they're coming to play it. Like if if you're coming to play, you know, uh, a game that you just want to focus more on like a murder mystery kind of a thing, you're looking for something that's more like PG-13, maybe R? Um, but like if you're, you know, like going for the Sherlock Holmes kind of, that kind of storytelling, or you're looking for Saw and you want an NC-17, like there will be, <laughs> there will be blood and gore. This is, this is about how it's going to go. Um, so we put that kind of stuff in there so that we can help when you're first creating the genre, you can kind of see where you want to go with it. And people going into your players coming into it know exactly what you're looking at. Like this is, this is what I'm about. This is the kind of game we're going to play. And, you know, it's another one of those things that we really, um, as a society have a better understanding of now. Like, you know, if I told you that we were going to go see an NC 17 movie, you'd have some predispositions about what you were about to see. Versus if I said we were going to go see something that was PG. Well, first off, if if I was if I was being taken to see an NC seventeen movie, I would end up getting violent flashbacks <laughs> to the time I subjected myself to a Serbian film. <laughs> well, see, there you go. Like that would that would have moments that would, when you sat down to game, be like, mm, I don't know that I want to be here for this. Or you could be like, okay, I am I am absolutely here for this. Let's do this. Which and then you know we have more steps for it too. But yeah. yeah. Now, within the, within the set within the uh, setup, I did I did see mm-hmm. this a bit in the beta, and I'm curious if this is going to be expanded upon. Um, are you going to Are you going to be expanding upon the general advice when it comes to creating archetypes? If somebody wants to do a do a setup that isn't covered in the book, absolutely. Yeah, we have we have. Um genre archetypes kind of to explain like the game and how to build it and then we have ones for specific for individuals as well so like um in this we talk about not only where we came up with it but like other things that you could base it on like um in the section we have like Jungian archetypes Mm -hmm. right like okay are you looking for something that doesn't fall in the list that we gave you hey maybe look at some of the you know these ones like okay cool the sage might make more sense awesome that's a great one or a rebel or whatnot and then maybe those don't work either you could have you know social archetypes maybe that makes much more sense so like if you're all you you could do a breakfast club if you wanted right like Mm -hmm. You could play that game out and build that genre out, so you have the nerd, the athlete, your your princess, the basket case, you know those kinds of genre- archetypes. And we we build out examples of these different things to give you ideas about how you look at the show that you want and the story that you want to tell. And then those archetypes kind of we already kind of know them. Like for the most mm-hmm. part, there's not a lot you have to build out. Like if you want to play Law and Order with the Mora system, you can. 
And you can have your archetypes be things like detective, the coroner, the forensic expert, things like that. So we know a lot of this stuff is things that we already know as people that are living in this society. We just show you where they're at, like, mm-hmm. and say, okay, this is where you could look for it, and this is how you could get inspired for it. And when it now when it now um, when it comes to the page count that you're sh- that you're shooting for, how bi- how big do you see this book being? I okay, so don't quote me on this because I am the business guy. Um, while I did some writing on this, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I believe we're sitting right around two hundred and thirty pages. That right. might be plus or minus a little bit, but I'm I'm, I'm pretty confident about that number. All oh, all right, and, and of course of course some. Um, of course, the, of course, this is where I put a big old asterisk with, with um, the with the inclusion of stretch goals because obviously, obviously, any any stretch goals or anything like that is going to um, expand the the overall page count. Right, for sure. Um, and how um, with it, how what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version? Um, I, f- for my goals, if I remember correctly, talking to our, our my partner that was doing layout, um, the goal is I think, like I'm again, please don't quote me on this because I, I this is might be wishful thinking depending upon if everything goes well. I think it's within the month. Um, I think we have about a month window like to finish the layout and stuff because the book is is ninety eight percent written other than when it comes to stretch goals. So that might. If we hit some stretch goals, that might push things around a little bit. But I believe the PDF was we want to distribute within the month, um, um, within a month of the Kickstarter ending, and then the physical copies we gave ourselves a little bit more room. But we're still um, we're still pressing with the depending upon shipping of the pandemic because our printer is in China, so it may we're hoping to be faster than. But we don't know for sure. But we gave ourselves a little bit of padding on the Kickstarter. Um, but the goal is to get the books obviously into people's hands as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. So PDFs will be going out. Like our layout person is already working on it. For example, to, to the stuff we know isn't going to change. Or the stuff we know that we're not going to have to add to. We're we're getting through layout now to be as ready as possible. All right, and I I will certain I will certainly be looking forward to to seeing how that how that kind of thing develops. Um, Thanks. Me too. <laughs> well, well, of co- well. Hopefully, you too. <laughs> it's your, it's your friggin' game. <laughs> this is true. This is true. I, b- I will be very excited mm-hmm. and <laughs> for the rest of this month. I'm going to continue to be excited. <laughs> yeah. And as I as I mentioned before, we went on the air. Um, congratulations on managing to get over your stretch goal of twenty one thousand and getting um a nice even twenty five thousand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's. It's uh, like we talked about before. It's one of those things that you're over the moon once it happens and you live in fear until it does. Because mm-hmm. um, we, all of us, the three of us that created the game um, and then all of the writers that we are lucky enough to work with, um, we believe in it very strongly. Um, the people, we've got you know Twitch games, people playing it already and things along those lines. But you never really know until it hits, <laughs> until it hits Kickstarter or your crowdfunding or whatnot how well you'll be received. And we're incredibly lucky that we have had a lot of support from friends and family and other people who have checked us out and said like hey i want to give this a shot so i'm psyched for it i think everybody's gonna really enjoy it once they get their hands on it and they see just how versatile it is Mm -hmm. so and with all that with all that said (laughs) i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me before we funded. Like, I, in case your viewers don't know, you reached out like in very, very early stages. I think in the first day or two when we when we launched, and mm-hmm. so I'm very glad that you reached out and were willing to give it a shot to these uh, these new kids who you probably had never heard of before. So, mm-hmm. thank you for having me. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to dis- whether it's to discuss genres and Mora, to discuss filmmaking, or ju- or just to just to laugh at the merciless nature of the dice gods. Um, uh, amen. The door, the door is always open. Well, we will hopefully hopefully be having like a, with this being successful, we have um, signed a licensing agreement with a couple other individuals to do follow-up books. Mm-hmm. So when I release, I, I believe we've mentioned it, so I can mention it here. But mm-hmm. we uh, 
we have a license agreement with Zorro to do a Zorro source book for for the Moro system. So when we get that put together, I'll have to come back on and tell you all about it. Yeah, I will. Um, I will try. You know, it's it's the funny thing is that for is that for a lot of people, um, their introduction to Zorro were the were the uh, two Banderas films. Mm-hmm. I do I do remember staying up late at ni- late at night when di- when I still had access to Disney and ca- and catching those old black catching those old oh, black and white. Oh, the episodes. mask of Zorro. Oh yeah, buddy. Um. Also, <laughs> also um. That I tell I tell a partial lie because my actual real introduction was. The um, '90s cartoon. Oh, okay. Well, hit me up after the show. I might have something for you uh, yeah. that you'll find pretty interesting. All, all right, I will. I will certainly do that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>